Thank you very much for attending this session. Today I will continue talking about moving average. You may look at this talk as Godfather 2 compared to Godfather 1 in a specific sense. Here, I'll discuss several issues regarding forecasting, time series analysis, and moving average. Some of them are related to the before the lecture that I have already delivered in Excel on moving average. And some parts are after that. And they do not progress in a linear fashion. I mean, some basic material, advanced, basic, advanced, like that. All processes and all functions in a business environment, they need forecasting. By processes, I mean like production, like order fulfillment and things like that. By Functions, I mean finance, marketing, operations, human resource. All of these functions and processes need forecasting. And one of the most popular tools for forecasting is our time series analysis, which analyze the changes in a factor of interest, in, an, in a variable of interest, and in our case, demand or sales over time. Marketing needs forecasting for current market demand, long-term trends, seasonality, understanding the relationship between price and demand, the relationship between promotion and demand, and so on and so forth. Finance needs forecasting for revenue and cost analysis, for cash flow analysis, for investment analysis, and so on and so forth. Operations needs forecasting for capacity planning, inventory management, operations planning, break-even analysis, and so on. Human resources need forecasting for hiring, training, and so on. And then we can go through accounting, cost accounting, asset accounting, and so on and so forth. All functions, all disciplines, and all processes in a business environment need forecasting. All forecasting techniques have four main characteristics. The first one is we cannot have a forecasting technique which exactly tell us what will happen. If I'm going to forecast the demand for the next month, there is no forecasting technique in this world to tell me exactly what the demand will be. All forecasting techniques will have some variation, some deviation from what will happen in reality because Real life is not deterministic. It is probabilistic. And no matter what you do, no matter how many systematic components that you find out, there is also randomness over there. Therefore, always forecast is different than what will happen, actually. And it is why all forecasting techniques provide us with average of what will happen, and beside average, at least we need standard deviation. There is no forecasting technique to exactly forecast what will happen, and therefore all forecasting techniques provide us just with average of what will happen, and that average need to be accompanied by a standard deviation. Forecast for aggregate items are more accurate than forecast for actual items. For example, forecast for the number of students in our institute next year is more accurate than forecast for College of Business. 
For College of Business, it's more accurate than for a specific department. Why? Because up and downs compensate each other. Something is less than what we think, something is more than what we think. When we forecast for all of them together, then this forecast thing will be more accurate than forecast for individual items. There is also mathematical proof for that. When we add some random variables together, their standard deviation is not added. Their variance is added. So variability is not increased based on the number of items that we incorporate into our forecasting. It will increase based on the square root of that number. While the average increases based on the, the number itself. And therefore, standard deviation divided by average which we call it coefficient of variations, will go down when we combine several items together and forecast for all of them. Finally, forecast for near future is more accurate than forecast for far future. For example, forecast for next week usually is much more accurate than forecast for next year. Forecast for next year is much more accurate than forecast for three years from now. Some people, some scientists, believe that the reason for attractiveness of the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach is the last two characteristics of all forecasting techniques. Volume of container handling is of measured in TEUs, 20 equivalent units. And that is one container 20 feet long. United States is ranked second in container handling in the world. And ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are ranked 10th uh, among all container terminals in the world. This is not for bulk handling, this is just for container handling volume of container handling in Port of Long Beach and Los Angeles is about 15, 16 million TEUs per year. As I said, some people believe, and they logically believe, that the last two characteristics of all forecasting techniques has led to the attractiveness of Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. About one third of all containerized material that is consumed in the whole United States come from ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Passes, come from far east, but past the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So they don't send it one by one to all states because when you aggregate them and send it to a specific place, that forecast is more accurate than forecast for each individual place. So they send it to Los Angeles and Long Beach, which they also call it San Pedro Bay ports, and then from there to different locations in the United States. Don't forget there are several routes to deliver <clears throat> containers from Far East to United States. They can send it to Mexico, they can send it to Texas, to Canada, and they can also send it from the Suez Canal to East. Why LA is more attractive? Because LA is closer. Ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, it takes two weeks trip compared to other routes which are three and four weeks. Therefore, because forecast for near future is more accurate and forecast for two weeks is more accurate than forecast for three weeks and forecast for four weeks, they send it to Los Angeles. And because aggregate forecast is more accurate than individual forecast, instead of sending it to, to different cities, different states, they first combine the demand of all these places together and send what is needed to Los Angeles and then in a shorter period of time they can send it to final destination. 
14 days to San Pedro Bay ports, two, three, four days to final destinations, shorter than three weeks plus something and four weeks plus something. There are quantitative forecasting and also qualitative forecasting. Most of our discussions will be on quantitative forecasting when we deal with numbers and scientific techniques. Qualitative forecasting relies on opinions, judgments, knowledge, and things like that of people who are the field or have some knowledge about the field. A very famous qualitative technique is Delphi technique. In Delphi technique, we open a problem for a group of experts and ask for their opinion. The opinion of some of them may be in this side, the others in this side. Maybe we call them left and right, but not in the political meaning. And then we provide the opinions of these people to these people and opinion of these people to these people and try to make their opinions close to each other. At each round, these judgments get closer and closer and closer, may got converged to some place like that. And then we stay here, which is the combination of both ideas. A very famous situation was when United States government asks some expert when they think they will be able to land on the moon and which equipment is required. This was about 10 years before actually Neil Armstrong and his crew go to moon. And experts had a forecast close to one year sooner than the event actually happened, and most of the equipment that they brought up in their judgment was, was used over there. Perhaps one of them was Stanley Kubrick with his Odyssey movie. Let's spend a little bit more time on time series analysis. These are quantitative techniques. They analyze a variable of interest, in our case, the usually demand or sales, analyze it over consecutive time periods, and based on those analysis, based on past data, they forecast the future. Moving averages are one of the very well-known time series analysis techniques. Then we have weighted moving average, exponential smoothing. And then we have regression analysis, which we can consider it as a time series analysis technique, or we can consider it as a causal or associative technique. We have linear regression, which analyzes the relationship between two or more variables, but in a linear fashion. For example, if you have three independent variables and one variable which depends on those y is equal to b0 plus b1x1 plus b2x2 plus b3x3. So as long as the relationship is a constant multiplied by a variable that is linear, but we can also have nonlinear regression like expression which has a power of two, or have a square root, or logarithm, and so on and so forth. In this course, we only consider linear regression between two variables or between more than two variables. We briefly show graphs of nonlinear regression. Question is, what is the measure of accuracy? How we can find it out between different techniques, which one is better? We talk about four measures, MAD, 
एम एस एम ए आर डी और एम ए पी एम ए आर डी आई मेड इट माई सेल्फ बट यूजली पीपल यूज द टर्म एम ए पी एम ए आर डी इज मीन एब्सोलूट रिलेटिव डेविएशन सो वी फाइंड अ डेविएशन एंड देन we absolute it in order not to allow plus and minus to cross each other so one other way of removing plus and minus is square the numbers and that is what mean square error is now if i divide the error the absolute value of the error by the actual value then i will have mean absolute relative deviation as i call it mar or the same thing is mean absolute percentage error we can measure them in scale of 0 to 1 or 0 to 100% both some are the same and finally we have tracking signal which is summation of error divided by mat let's spend few minutes on systematic and random components of time series in my analysis i try to bring examples which are of our close vicinity and because we are in southern california and because after entertainment and healthcare perhaps transportation is the third largest segment of the economy in this state here i have 23 year data of these two ports ports of los angeles and long beach or san pedro bay ports let's look at this graph and see what we observe the first thing i observe here is this point level The second thing I observe is movement this general pattern I call it trend level trend the third thing we observe is seasonality if we look at the year small goes high and then come back small small high then come back small So we see something like this over a period of 12 months we call it seasonality and then finally one other pattern that we may observe and we usually observe is a pattern over a period of 5 to 10 years which they call it boom economy and recession if we look at these numbers here are good times good times economy is performing well volume of activity in general is high if we look at here not that good recession boom level trend seasonality and cycle This ends my introductory talk. Please watch the Excel recording that I have. I go through technical aspect of doing moving average and so on. And then after that I will have a set of problems for moving average. Thank you very much for your attention.